Our second scripture today is from the letter to the Ephesians, the first chapter, verses 15 to 23. I've heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints. For this reason, I do not cease to give thanks for you as I remember you in my prayers. I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation as you come to know him, so that with the eyes of your heart enlightened, you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance among the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power for us who believe according to the working of his great power. God put this power to work in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. He has put all things under his feet and has made him the head over all things for the church which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. It's easy to feel bad about the church these days. Easy. The mainline church has been in decline for decades. And, and we all know those stories. We all remember, those of us sitting here, remember those times when churches were full and the membership has been shrinking since a long time, at least the 70s. Members have gotten older. Most of us remember times when there were lots of small children running around in these churches. And now, almost everybody has hair, if they have hair, <laughs> the same color as mine. The influence of the mainline church has waned. Used to be that when you said the word Christian, mainline churches are the people you thought of. Now, that doesn't even come to mind for most people when that word is used. The future looks bleak for the mainline church, according to many folk. We hear about churches like First Baptist of Palo Alto getting ready to close their doors forever, and many times we think, hmm, who's next? Which church is next? And of course, the problems for the church aren't only in the main lion church. It's been a little slower to start in the evangelical churches, but it's going on there as well. The Southern Baptists last year reported the lowest number of baptisms that they have had in 74 years. They keep numbers very, very carefully. And they're going through all kinds of gyrations trying to explain what has happened. Millennials are fleeing the evangelical church and talk about it being out of touch, judgmental, and indeed sometimes downright evil. They hear that Franklin Graham calls Mayor Pete to repent of his loving monogamous marriage, while at the same time holding Donald Trump with three marriages, multiple affairs, children from multiple different women, blatant misogyny as a savior. And you may have heard that Today, Franklin Graham has called for all churches to have a day of prayer for Donald Trump that he may prevail against his enemies. Those millennials hear these kinds of things and they don't even shake their heads as they turn and run the other direction. And many observers looking at that have raised the question as to whether this identification of the evangelical church with this current incarnation of, of the GOP has damaged the church, perhaps beyond repair. 
It is a troubling and difficult time for the church, but the reality is as soon as I say that, we have to also realize there have always been troubling and difficult times for the churches. Whenever the church has done what it was supposed to do and been what it was supposed to be, it's always gotten itself in trouble. It's always gotten itself in trouble. And the earliest days of the church certainly reflect that reality. Still, the church in Ephesus was a good place to be. The people were people of serious faith, so much so that the writer of the letter to the Ephesians begins by saying that he constantly gives thanks for their faith and for their faithfulness in loving the rest of the saints. There's an implication as we read this little passage that this was a church where the people were balanced in their understanding of what it means to be a Christian. They worked on their interior lives. They took care of the spiritual side of who they were. They, they engaged in prayer and Bible study and worship, and they worked to build up that community of faith that made them people of faith and gave them the support and the encouragement they needed to grow as followers of Jesus. They had that part down. But, but that wasn't the only thing they did. They also knew that faith without works is dead. That they had to be out there in the world living their faith. And so they were giving and caring and supporting and doing evangelism. They even were supporting what we would now call foreign missionaries. Sending resources to support others who were doing mission work far and wide. And that was a serious commitment in times when not very many people had spare money to give to anyone. And when there was no way to hold others accountable for how they used those funds once they got there. There was no way to know whether that foreign missionary they had given the money to was actually doing mission work or had just bought themselves a new Learjet and were enjoying the luxuries, the luxuries of, of living on someone else's dime. They were the model of what a church was supposed to be. And the writer knew that. And, and so gave thanks for them, and heard about that even from some distance. You don't get the sense that the writer knew these people. He only heard. And so I was saying, yeah, you guys, you're the ones that we all are trying to live up to. You're the ones that all the pastors say, you know, if I can be pastor of a church, that's the one I want to go to, because that's, that, that, they, got it. they got it going on. But looking at that, the writer knows this isn't the end of the journey. There's still more. The writer prays that they might grow in their knowledge of who Jesus is. They might get to know him better. And that as a result of that, they would know three things. They would know the hope to which they're called. They would be aware that God was at work in and through them, and the future was in God's hands. They could trust that God is good all, all the time. time. And they could experience that in their daily lives. And no matter when things looked bleak, and they did look bleak sometimes for the early Christians, especially you get here, these are folk who are Gentiles, and, and the other Christians weren't sure about them. You say, yeah, you can't be a Christian and be a Gentile. We've heard that kind of statement, haven't we? You can't be a Christian and be a Gentile, so they were being thrown out by, by the other church members, but at the same time, the non-Christians weren't accepting them because they had gone somewhere different than them, too. So they were really struggling, and yet, and yet the writer is reminding them that even when things look bleak, you can have hope because God is at work. Second, that you know the riches of God's glorious inheritance. That they were the children of God. Not cast-offs begging for bread. Not a ragtag group that had been 
pushed to the margins and ignored. They were the very children of God, the children of the one who created the entire universe and held that universe in hand. And finally, to know the immeasurable greatness of God's power at work in them. When they felt inadequate, when the needs looked too big, when they were positive they did not have the resources to do what they knew in their heart of hearts needed to be done, they had to remember that God's power was at work in them. And the power that was at work in them is the very power that defeats the ultimate power they all knew and all experienced, the power of death. That was the power at work in them, the power of God's love, which brings life, and life abundant. This passage today appears in the lectionary twice in this three-year cycle. It tells you that the people who put the lectionary together really thought this was an important passage for the churches to read. And, and, and looking back over my history, I obviously agree with them. I preached on this passage a bunch of times. A bunch of times. And, and because it comes up twice in the, in the lectionary, it, it's often, more often than every three years that I've preached on it. Sometimes it's been every, it's only been a, 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 a less than a year between two of those sermons. So, it's one that obviously I, I feel good about. And, and I went back and read a bunch of those earlier sermons, and most of them I spend a good bit of my time, most of the ones that I've preached here, and I've preached to here a bunch of times. Anne can look in her Bible, she keeps those little notes there, and she's probably going, man, he likes this passage. Most of those times I spend about half of the sermon listing the characteristics of this church for which I am most thankful. And, and it, it takes at least half of my sermon to list the ones that I want to list. And I'm not going to go there today except to say that the list is there and there's a long list and, and this is an amazing congregation. I know a good bit about a lot of the churches in Greater Santa Barbara, and, and I'm completely and absolutely honest when I say if I was moving into this community today and looking for a church, this would be the one I would attend. There's, there's not even a question. When I met with the pulpit committee, boy, how many years ago was that, Charlie? We were all young. My hair was dark and thick. <laughs> And I weighed 40 pounds less. I said something to the pulpit committee, and, and it, was, it was half in jest and half serious. I said, you have to be out there in the community telling everybody, if I come to this church, you have to tell everybody that Cambridge Drive Church has the best pastor in the area. <laughs> and that Cambridge Drive church is the best church in the area. Well, the best pastor part, that's, you can do with that whatever you want. But I believed, and I still believe, the part that this is the best church in the area. It's that simple. It really is that simple. And <laughs> What, what was it about building a raptor? <laughs> but like the church in Ephesus, there are areas that we could grow. And, and I'm not talking about programmatic areas. That's, that's another issue altogether. We could talk about how some of the churches have, do still have big youth programs, or some of them have small groups that meet and do things that ours don't do. We could, we could talk about all of that, and that's, that's programmatic, and, and, and that's just that's secondary stuff. The real places that we need to grow have to do with the same things that the writer wrote to the Ephesians. We need to grow in hope. Now, there have been times when this congregation has, has been whatever the opposite of hopeful is. There, there have been times when we've been really anxious about the future and really worried about the future. And, and, and I've, I've heard those things talk, talked about. 
And I've heard people say, oh, what's going to happen to us? Where are we going to be in six months or a year or, or five years? And the reality is that I, I don't sense that kind of thing going on right now. I might be missing it, but I, I don't sense it. But at the same time, I also don't sense a, an active anticipation of the future. I don't get a sense that we're on the other end of that spectrum and going, wow, tomorrow is going to be amazing, and the day after that's going to be better yet, and, and I can't wait to see what comes next. And, and at the bottom line, that lack of that positive anticipation, that lack of hope, is a lack of faith. Because if we truly believe that God is at work, man, the future is so bright i got to wear shades. If knowing that God is at work here among us doesn't give us hope, I don't know what in the world possibly could. The knowledge of the glorious inheritance, that these superlatives this writer uses are, are kind of fun. The glorious inheritance that is ours because we are the children of God. Now, we're not God's only children. We're not God's only children. And, 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 and we don't, you know, we're not even the best children. We're not getting the, the lion's share. You know, it's not a situation where there was firstborn who get twice what everybody else gets, and that's us. That's, that's not what I mean at all. But the fact that we are God's children and that the God who created the universe is pouring all of that out for us really is something to get excited about and something about which we ought to be aware. And then the final one, to be aware of the immeasurable greatness of God's power. Again, these superlatives. The immeasurable greatness of God's power at work in us. That's really important. Because sometimes, I don't know about you, but sometimes we feel impotent. Sometimes we feel resigned to the status quo because we just don't know how to make anything else happen. And, and we are facing huge issues. Some of them are so huge that, that uh, psychologists tell us we can't even get our heads around it. And that's part of the reason why we don't do anything. So, you know, we, we, we're facing the, the reality of climate change that could change the entire the entire earth. We can't get our heads around that, so we just forget about it. We've got wealth inequality growing, and, and in spite of people telling us the economy is doing really well, there's a lot of people out there who are not doing really well, and indeed are finding themselves exactly the opposite. We see tribalism growing at a time when it's supposed to be going the other direction. Build walls when we ought to be reaching out to one another. We see wanton violence. And, and it happens so often it doesn't even make the front page anymore. We don't even hear politicians say, thoughts and prayers. Because they have to do it every single day, literally. And then they try to blame the victims. Well, yeah, those people got shot because if they'd been smarter, they wouldn't have been there. Or, or if they'd, they'd done a better job of keeping ex-employees out. <clears throat> Come on. And we are divided politically and continue to live in different silos. You may have seen the, the person, uh, we've all heard of the, the one GOP member, the very conservative GOP Tea Party guy, who's come out and says we should have impeachment now. And he was back speaking to his, his constituents and, and a woman stood up and or she, she was interviewed afterwards and she said, I had never heard before today that there was anything bad in the, in the Mueller report. Well, 
you know, regardless of where you come out on the politics of any of that, the fact that she was in a silo that said there's nothing bad in the Mueller report is just insane. It's insane. There's an op-ed in today's news press that says there was no crime involved in any of this. That's insane. It's insane. There was all kinds of crimes. All kinds, starting with the fact that Russia interfered with the election, made an attack on our democracy, and, and, and it goes on from there. And, and to live in a silo that misses that shows how divided we have become. When we can't even agree on what the facts are, where do you go from there? There's a lot of really bad stuff to be worried about in the future. It's easy to feel like, you know what? I live in a beautiful place. I can go sit on the beach, take my lawn chair with me, just listen to the waves come in, have a nice bottle of wine. You know, I'm going to go for a ride on my horse. It, it, I don't need this stuff anymore. This is, I'm just going to chill. Because after all, I live on the Gold Coast. I can do that. And so let it all go past. That's the temptation, for me at least. That's the temptation for me. I'm guessing it is for, for many of us. <clears throat> But the writer would remind us that, no, 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 yeah, those are big problems. They are monstrous problems. They are problems so big that there is no way you're going to solve them before you die. But, don't forget, the immeasurable greatness of God's power is at work in you. The same power that defeats even the power of death. The same power that takes Jesus, whom Rome killed, as a political terrorist, takes him and sits him at the right hand of God and says, yeah, every name is under you. The very power of God is at work in us. The power that raised Jesus from the dead, the power that birthed the church from that ragtag group of little followers of Jesus and turned it into this group that changed the very direction of history, the chain power that inspired people 60 years ago to start this little congregation. The same power, immeasurable, beyond measure, is at work here in us. I have a, a friend who's a, a writer, and she, she's written a sci-fi series that I, I enjoy a lot, called the Fear Series. And, and the main character is a, a woman named Jag, Jaguar Adams. And Jaguar has a tagline, and, and I love it. Whenever things start to get shaky, Jaguar says, see what you are, be what you see. See what you are, be what you see. I think the writer to the church at Ephesus would have smiled at that and said, yeah, you just summed up my letter. See what you are. You are the children of God. You are the ones who can have hope because the future is in God's hands and God is at work. See that you are the ones in whom the very power of God's love is at work. See what you are. God's children. God's church. The hands and feet of Jesus at work in the world. See what you are. Cambridge Drive Church. And be what you see.